This is Kathy Knipfer, instructor for Nursing 2203, recording the pediatric lecture for Chapter 39, Pediatric Variations of Nursing Intervention. There are certain requirements for obtaining informed consent. The person must be capable of giving the consent. The usual age of majority is 18. The person has to receive the information needed to make an intelligent decision. They also must act voluntarily when exercising this freedom of choice. Parents or legal guardians are required to give informed consent for minors. They must receive the information they need to make an intelligent decision. That would include things like what the procedure is, what the risks and benefits are, as well as the alternatives. If they're mature or emancipated minor, they can sign for themselves. Many of the states allow for this scenario. An emancipated minor may be one who's been pregnant, or they're married, or they've graduated from high school, or they live independently, or they have provided military service. Appropriate care should not be withheld or delayed because of problems obtaining consent. Individuals caring for a child may be given permission by the parents to give informed consent by proxy. The nurse should document any efforts made to obtain consent. All 50 states have enacted legislation that entitles them to consent to treatment for one or more medically emancipated conditions. These might include sexually transmitted infections, mental health services, alcohol drug dependency, pregnancy, contraceptives. Care can be given without the psychological preparation of the child for a procedure is very important. The nurse should follow age-specific guidelines for preparation, and it should be based on developmental and cognitive ability. It's very important to establish trust, as you know. Parental presence and support is important as well. If the parent wishes to stay during a procedure, they need to be told where to sit or stand, what to say, what to do to help. If the parent does not wish to be present, we should support that decision. The parents should be encouraged to stay close by so that they will be available to support the child when the procedure is finished. Age-appropriate explanations are one of the most widely used interventions for reducing anxiety in children who undergo procedures. The child also might receive sedation and analgesia before a stressful procedure. It's important to use objects to supplement the verbal explanations for young children. It's important that you review the guidelines on pages 1132 through 1134. It's about preparing the child for the procedures along with age-specific preparation. And that during performance of the procedure, we should expect success and approach it with confidence. We should involve the child. This helps to gain cooperation and allows them to make choices. It gives them some control. We also want to provide distraction during the procedure. It may involve using play. We want them to express their feelings openly. It's okay for them to cry. And after the procedure, we want to provide support and also, at that time, allow for expression of feelings. This picture reflects an opportunity for the child to play out fears. It's customary for the parents to be present during preoperative care. Sometimes the parents are allowed to go back to the operating room if they're having a surgical procedure and stay until the patient goes to sleep. Preoperative medications provide for anxiety reduction, amnesia, sedation, 
They have an antiemetic effect and help to reduce secretions. This picture reflects the parent in the OR before the patient goes to sleep. During postoperative care, there's continuous monitoring as well as monitoring of vital signs. Pain management is very important. Also, because respiratory tract infections are a potential complication of anesthesia, we would want to aerate the lungs and remove secretions to minimize that risk. Patient education is important during the postoperative period, which includes the discharge instruction. Malignant hyperthermia is a life-threatening condition that's triggered by inhaled anesthetic agents and the muscle relaxant succinylcholine. It produces hypermetabolism. Symptoms include increased in tidal CO2, increased temperature, tachycardia, tachypnea, acidosis, muscle rigidity, and rhabdomyolysis. Treatment includes discontinuing the triggering agent, 100% oxygenation, IV dantrolene sodium, ice pack, and NG lavage if they're hyperthermic, and then they need to be observed postoperatively. It can recur. Skin care and general hygiene. Pressure ulcer prevention is important for both children and adults. The type of bathing, of course, depends on how old the child is. It would be important for the nurse to teach proper hygiene for uncircumcised boys. The foreskin should be retracted gently, the exposed surfaces should be cleansed, and then the foreskin should be replaced. Infants and debilitated children require the nurse or a family member to perform mouth care. Young children may be able to manage, but they might need some supervision and assistance. Older children are capable of brushing and flossing without assistance, but they sometimes need reminders. Children should have their hair brushed and combed at least once daily, and then it's styled for comfort. For most children, washing the hair and scalp once or twice weekly is sufficient unless there's an indication for more frequent washing. Adolescents may need more frequent hair care. When feeding a sick child, we should take a diet history and make eating time as similar as possible to eating at home. We want to encourage parents or other family members to feed the child and be present. Providing finger foods for young children is important. We want to ensure a variety of foods, textures, and colors. Make the food attractive. There are guidelines on page 1142 in your textbook that give some more tips for feeding a sick child. When controlling elevated temperatures or hyperthermia, there are some definitions that you should remember. The set point is the temperature around which body temperature is regulated by a thermostat-like mechanism in the hypothalamus. Fever, also known as hyperpyrexia, is an elevation in the set point, such that the body temperature is regulated at a higher level. Hyperthermia is where the body temperature exceeds the set point. This usually results from the body or external conditions that create more heat than the body can eliminate, such as with a heat stroke, aspirin toxicity, seizures, or hyperthyroidism. A fever is treated with antipyretics to lower the set point. Acetaminophen, NSAIDs, but not aspirin can be used. With hyperthermia, cooling methods would be used, such as cooling devices, cool compresses, or a tepid tub bath. The set point is normal with hyperthermia, so antipyretics are of no value. Environmental safety measures 
for the protection of adults also apply to children. This would include good illumination, floors that are clear of fluid and objects that might contribute to falls, also non-skid surfaces in showers and tubs. Windows should be secured. Window blind and curtain cords should be out of reach with split cords to prevent strangulation. Pacifiers should not be tied around the neck or attached to an infant by a string. Electrical equipment should be in proper working order and electrical outlets should have covers. Staff members should practice proper care and disposal of small objects such as syringe caps, needle covers, and temperature probes. Bath water temperature should be checked carefully before placing the child in it and never leave children alone in a bathtub. Proper use of strollers and car seats is important. Infants and small children should never be left unattended on a treatment table. Cribs that meet federal safety standards should be used. Sides should be always raised and fastened securely. The, slave, the safest sleeping position to prevent sudden infant death syndrome is wholly supine. That ba is based on the task force on sudden infant death syndrome. No pillows should be placed in the crib while the infant is sleeping. Toys should be appropriate for the child's age, condition, and treatment. Children who are at risk of falling should be identified. It may be due to medications, altered mental status, altered or limited mobility. It could be a patient who's just had surgery, one who's had a history of falls, one who has been in a crib with side rails down or on a day bed with family members. Nurses should continually think of ways to prevent falls, keeping the bed in the lowest position, making sure the call bell is within reach, make sure that necessary or desired items are within reach, offer toileting on a regular basis, keep lights on, lock wheelchairs. There are many methods for preventing falls and we should always be um, cognizant of those fall prevention. The nurse should always pay attention to preventing nosocomial infections. This is monitored by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We use standard precautions as well as transmission-based precautions. You should be familiar with airborne droplet and contact precautions, but just for a review you can look on page 1146 and box 39-2. When transporting infants and children, infants and small children can be carried short distances. With older children, you should use a suitable conveyance for more extended trips. That could be with a bassinet or a crib, a stroller or a wagon, or a wheelchair or a stretcher. Here are some appropriate methods for transporting infants and children in a clinical facility. When restraints are necessary, diversional activities, parental participation, and therapeutic holding should be considered first. Sometimes restraints are a necessary part of medical surgical procedures. Behavioral restraints are used if there's a risk that a patient will harm the self or others. It requires an order at least one hour after initiation of the restraint. It must be reordered every one to two hours depending on the age. A licensed independent practitioner must conduct in-person evaluations within one hour and repeat those evaluations every four hours until the restraints are discontinued. Here are some examples of some effective restraining methods. Here is an example of therapeutic holding 
while a procedure is being performed. Sometimes infants and small children are unable to cooperate for many procedures. The nurse is responsible for minimizing the patient's movement during these procedures. Older children usually only need minimal restraint. Positioning will vary based on the location of the punctures. In the next slide, you'll see the proper positioning for lumbar puncture. Here is the proper positioning for lumbar puncture. Clean catch urine specimens are those that are obtained for culture after the urethral meatus is cleansed and the first few milliliters of urine are voided. In girls, the perineum is wiped with an antiseptic pad from front to back. In boys, the tip of the penis is cleansed. With a 24-hour urine collection, collection bags are required in infants and small children. Older children may require special instructions about notifying someone when they need to void or have a bowel movement. The collection period always starts and ends with an empty bladder. When catheterizing a bladder, the toddler, preschooler, or young child can be prepared for catheterization. They can be given instructions about pelvic floor relaxation. They could blow on a pinwheel, and press the hips against the bed or procedure table. The catheter should never be advanced when resistance is met. After the patient relaxes, the catheter can then be advanced. As you know, catheterization is a sterile procedure and we always use sterile or we always use standard precautions. Analysis of stool specimens help to identify parasites or other organisms that could cause diarrhea. They also help to assess gastrointestinal function and they help to assess uh, occult blood. It's best that the stool not be contaminated with urine. Stool specimens should be large enough to obtain an adequate sample it shouldn't be just a little tiny piece. Venous blood samples can be obtained by venipuncture or by aspiration from a peripheral or central access device. The type of fluid being infused should be considered when determining where to access the specimen from. For example, if the IV has glucose in it, it could alter the blood glucose level. Arterial samples may be obtained by arterial puncture and they can be used to evaluate arterial blood gases. A common method for obtaining blood samples from infants younger than six months of age is by a heel stick. You'll see a diagram in your book on the appropriate puncture site. Before the sample is taken, the heel should be warmed for three minutes and cleansed with alcohol. A, an automatic lancet device should be used to obtain the sample. For respiratory secretion specimens, they should be cough specimens. For infants and small children who are unable to follow directions to cough, a gastric lavage can be used or a gastric washing. A specimen can easily be aspirated from the trachea or major bronchi if someone has a tracheostomy and a collection device can be used through the suction apparatus. Nasal washings can be used to help diagnose RSV. Some the sterile areas show saline proper location for heel puncture. With a sterile syringe and Various formulas that involve age, weight, and body surface area, or BSA, are used as the basis for calculating dosages for pediatric patients. 
Checking dosages is a good and safe practice even if it's not required by hospital policy. Patients should be identified with two identifiers. Usually it's the name and date of birth or it could be the name and medical record number. In some situations, it's important to prepare the parent for giving medications. It's less traumatic for the child if the parent gives medications in some situations. It's important to prepare the child regarding what's going to happen with administration of medication, especially something like an injection. Administration of medication. For oral medication, the dosage would be most accurate if a syringe is used. For intramuscular injections, you want to select a small syringe because it would be more accurate. That's just a general statement. And then the needle should be long enough to go through the subcutaneous tissue and hit the muscle. The medication needs to be injected into the body of the muscle. The needle length should be approximately one half to one inch or five eighths to one inch for the vastus lateralis. You would want to use the smallest diameter possible to minimize pain, but larger gauge needles may be needed for viscous medication. When determining the site for the injection, the nurse should look at the amount and character of the medication that's going to be injected, also the amount and general condition of the muscle mass, and the frequency or number of injections that are going to be given. You would also look at the type of medication, You would want to avoid tracking any medication through superficial tissues. To do this, you would replace the needle after withdrawing medication, that's one way, or use Z-Track or an air bubble technique. And then also you would avoid any depression of the plunger during insertion of the needle. Detailed guidelines for intramuscular injections are available in your textbook. Insulin, hormone replacement, allergy desensitization, and some vaccines are given subcutaneously. And then for intradermal injections, that might be tuberculin testing, local anesthesia, and allergy testing. The nurse should use a 26 to 30 gauge needle to minimize pain for these sub-Q and intradermal injections. The angle of the needle for the subcutaneous injection is typically 90 degrees. Some recommend a 45 degree angle for a child with little subcutaneous tissue, but that is controversial. There are important safety factors to consider with intravenous administration of medication. When the drug is administered intravenously, the effect is almost instantaneous, so you don't have any control. We should know the specified minimum dilutions, rates of flow, and whether drugs are irritating or toxic. So we need to know about what we're giving. We want to make sure that the dosage is calculated correctly and that it's a safe dose. We want to know the length of time over which the drug can be safely administered. We want to know about drugs that it is incompatible with or even compatibility with IV fluids. Some basic rules to remember. Always check the site of insertion of the IV for patency before administering any medication. Never administer medications with blood products. We also need to be careful Intravenous about fluid devices overload would in include peripheral patients. intermittent infusion devices or locks, and these would have to be flushed regularly to keep them patent. Also, central venous access devices, short-term non-tunnel catheters, long-term tunnel catheters, implanted infusion ports, and also peripherally inserted central catheters. These are all options for IV medication.
here are some examples of intravenous devices. Notice that the implanted cord has to be accessed by a special needle, and this is called a Huber needle. It goes through the skin and settles down into the port. Medications can also be administered through nasogastric, orogastric, or gastrostomy tubes. The advantage would be that the nurse would have the ability to administer medications around the clock without disturbing the child. A disadvantage would be clogging or occlusion, but that can be prevented through adequate flushing of the tube. Rectal administration of medications provides an alternate route when the oral route is difficult or contraindicated. The disadvantage is that it's less reliable. Also, feces may interfere with absorption. The technique would be to wear gloves and, of course, remove the wrapper from the medication, lubricate it with warm water, and insert the pointed end in first, and then insert it past both sphincters, hold the buttocks together until the urge to expel it has passed, and this usually occurs within five to 10 minutes. We may be required to administer medications through the optic, otic, and nasal routes. We may need to administer eye drops or nasal drops. It may be difficult to obtain cooperation from the child, so we may need to be a little bit creative. Parental presence may be helpful. For otic administration, for children under the age of three, we would pull the pinna downward and straight back. For otic administration for children above the age of three, you would pull the pinna upward and back. For infection control concerns, for otic administration, to avoid contamination of the dropper, we could use an ear speculum. Here's an example of proper administration of optic medication. Here's an example of proper administration of nasal medications. Aerosol therapy deposits medications directly into the airway. It is useful in avoiding systemic side effects. The medication can be nebulized with oxygen or it can be administered through a meter dose inhaler. Fluid balance is critical for pediatric patients. Fluid should be measured from all sources. It may be urine, stools, vomitus, drainage from fistulas, drainage from nasogastric suction or sweat, and also drainage from wounds. It's the nurse's responsibility to keep an accurate INO record on certain children. They would include those that receive IV therapy, those who just had surgery, those who receive diuretics or steroid therapy, those who have suffered burns or other injuries, renal disease, congestive heart failure, dehydration, diabetes mellitus, oliguria, those in respiratory distress, and those with chronic lung disease. There's a diaper weighing technique that can be used. The dry diaper would be weighed and the wet diaper would be weighed, and then the weight of the dry diaper would be subtracted from the weight of the wet diaper. If the child is NPO, one would post a sign as well as remove fluids from the bedside. In cases where there might be peripheral circulatory collapse or hypovolemic shock or cardiopulmonary arrest, rapid access may be needed. So they might put in an intraosseous infusion, and this would be done through a large bore needle, such as a bone marrow aspiration needle or an intraosseous needle. It's inserted into the medullary cavity of a long bone, usually the proximal tibia. Patients who receive intraosseous infusions are usually unconscious or they're sedated because it's very painful. Also, safety catheters and needle systems should be used to avoid needle punctures. When selecting a scalp vein, the hair may need to be clipped, but save the hair for the parents. For most IV infusions in children, a 22 to 24 gauge catheter may be used if the therapy doesn't last 
longer than five days. You should use the smallest gauge and the shortest length catheter that will work for the delivery of medication. Sometimes a surgical cut down is necessary to get to the vessel and it's important to use infusion pumps for pediatric patients. This ensures dosage accuracy and minimizes the possibility of overloading the circulation. Often, a transparent dressing and a commercial securement device, such as a stat lock, is used at the puncture site. A protective cover is often applied directly over the catheter insertion site for added protection. When removing a catheter, we should provide a careful explanation of the process to the child and even provide suggestions for helping. Maybe the child could remove or help remove the tape. The nurse should follow manufacturer recommendations for removing a transparent dressing this as well as secure shows devices. acceptable vessels that can be used for parenteral fluid therapy. The Trent Illuminator is placed on the skin to illuminate veins. An opening allows cannulation of the vessel. This is a stat lock, which is a commercially available securement device for IVs. This is an IV house that provides protection at the IV insertion site. Notice the transparent dressing on the skin. Let's go over some procedures for maintaining respiratory function. Oxygen is administered for hypoxemia and may be delivered by mask, nasal cannula, face tent, hood, face mask, or ventilator. Plastic hoods are well tolerated by infants. At least 4 to 5 liters per minute of flow is necessary to maintain oxygen concentration and remove exhaled carbon dioxide. Prolonged exposure to high oxygen tension can damage some body tissues, such as retinas and lungs. Individuals with chronic pulmonary disease such as cystic fibrosis have adapted to the continuously higher arterial carbon dioxide tension level. Therefore, hypoxia becomes the more powerful stimulus for respiration. When the arterial oxygen tension level is elevated during oxygen administration, the hypoxic drive is removed. This causes progressive hypoventilation and increased PaCO2 levels and the child becomes rapidly unconscious. Oxygen saturation can be measured through pulse oximetry. In tidal CO2 monitoring measures exhaled carbon dioxide non-invasively. Normal values are 30 to 43 millimeters of mercury. Postural drainage is indicated whenever excessive fluid or mucus in the bronchi is not being removed by normal ciliary activity and cough. Positioning allows for the maximum advantage of gravity to facilitate removal of secretion. Chest physical therapy usually refers to the use of postural drainage along with adjunctive techniques. Here is a picture of oxygen being administered via a plastic hood. Procedures for maintaining respiratory function. If the condition of an intubated patient deteriorates, we would consider DOPE, displacement, obstruction, pneumothorax, or equipment failure. Basic care of a patient on a ventilator would be maintenance of skin integrity. We would protect pressure points. We would turn the patient every two hours. We would provide analgesia and sedation as needed. We would use aggressive hand hygiene, oral care, and elevate the head of the bed between 30 and 45 degrees to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. Children who have undergone a tracheostomy 
must be monitored closely for complications such as hemorrhage, edema, aspiration, accidental decannulation, tube obstruction, and the entrance of free air into the pleural cavity. The focus of nursing care would be to maintain a patient, patent airway, facilitate the removal of pulmonary secretions, provide humidified air or oxygen, clean the stoma, monitor the ability to swallow, and teach while simultaneously preventing complications. Suctioning of a tracheostomy tube should last no more than five seconds. The suction catheter should have a di diameter that is half of the diameter of the trach. Suctioning should be done just to the end of the trach tube. The child should be allowed to rest for 30 to 60 seconds in between suctioning. The nurse should assess the tracheostomy stoma for signs of infection and skin breakdown. The skin and the dressing should remain clean and dry. Life-threatening occlusion is apparent when the child displays signs of respiratory distress and a suction catheter cannot be passed to the end of the tube despite several attempts and installation of saline. This situation requires an immediate tube change. Accidental decannulation also requires immediate tube replacement. A chest tube is placed to remove fluid or air from the pleural or pericardial space. Once the tube is in place, that is the chest tube, it should be connected to an appropriate chest drainage system. Disposable chest drainage systems typically consist of three chambers next to one another in one drainage unit. The fluid collection chamber collects drainage from the patient's pleural or pericardial space. The water seal chamber is connected directly to the fluid collection chamber and acts as a one-way valve that protects the patient from air returning to the pleural or pericardial space. The suction chamber may be a dry suction or a calibrated water chamber. It's connected to the external vacuum suction set, to the amount of suction ordered, and controls the amount of suction that the patient experiences. Hospital policy should be followed when taking care of chest tubes. Generally, chest tubes should not be clamped, but there may be this some situations where it would need to be clamped. proper suctioning procedure for a tracheostomy. Here's a trach on an infant. One finger should be able to be inserted underneath the tie. Here's an example of a disposable chest drainage system. Alternative feeding technique. It is very important to check placement for nasogastric tubes. After Placement is confirmed. Positioning is also important. The child should be positioned with the head elevated 30 to 45 degrees. You can see specific guidelines in your textbook on page 1187. Other ways of administering feedings is through a gastrostomy tube or a jejunostomy tube, and that would be for those with a high risk of regurgitation or aspiration. These feedings could be done continuously or as an intermittent bolus. These pictures show measurements and insertion for oral gastric feeding. More on alternative feeding techniques. Nasoduodenal and nasojejunal tubes are used with children at high risk for regurgitation or aspiration. They're provided on a continuous feeding basis and they're delivered by pump. Total parenteral nutrition provides for the total nutritional needs of infants and children. It involves infusion of highly concentrated solutions of protein, glucose, and other nutrients. It's also called TPN. The teaching plan regarding these techniques should involve a return demonstration. The procedure for giving an enema to an infant or child does not differ essentially from that for an adult, except for the type an amount of fluid administered, and the distance for inserting the tube into the rectum. 
An isotonic solution is used in children. Plain water is not used because, being hypotonic, it can cause rapid fluid shifts and fluid overload. The fleet enema is not advised for children because of the harsh action of its ingredients. Because infants and young children are unable to retain this solution after it is administered, the buttocks must be held together for a short time to retain the fluid. Children may require stomas for various health problems. The most frequent causes in infants are necrotizing enterocolitis, imperforate anus, and less often Hirschsprung's disease. In older children, the most frequent causes are inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's disease, also called regional enteritis, and ureteral ostomies for distal ureter or bladder defects. Older children need to be prepared for the procedure and should be taught care of the ostomy. Children with ileostomies are fitted immediately after surgery with an appliance to protect the skin. Infants may not be fitted with a pouch right away. Sometimes a gauze dressing is enough. Skin care is very important for children 